Great. We're going back to the book of Galatians. We're going back to the book of Galatians of salvation is through Christ alone, by faith alone. Okay? That major theme of the book of Galatians. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Corinthians, and then you get into General Electric Power Company or Go Eat Popcorn or however you do it. But uh, Galatians is the, the second one of those four epistles of Paul. Or the first one, I'm right, right? Galatians, Ephesians, I got it wrong. The first one, Galatians is first. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. So we're in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. We're going to talk about the doctrine of adoption, how God is our Father and how He loves us deeply. I hope this is an encouraging message for you. Uh, that's okay, we'll start at 26. I think I did tell her that, just for the background. Verse three, uh, chapter 3, verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So that's kind of like the background to remind you where we were at a couple months ago. Verse one of chapter four, what I'm saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no longer from, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. Verse two, the heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. Verse three, so also when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the time set had come fully, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption. There it is. To sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts. The spirit, that's the Holy Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Powerful stuff talking about the doctrine of adoption. Um, Tony Morita at Imago Dei Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, guy I love to follow, great preacher, great uh, teacher of preaching at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, he talks about how this very chapter right here, this little passage, was so convicting to him and his wife Kim that they ended up adding to their family of two biological children by adopting four more. Three that they picked up in the Ukraine and one that they picked up in Ethiopia. D David Platt, preaching on this very passage, says that this was the passage that convinced him and his wife to adopt a horde of children too. To bring in those who are fatherless, those that are orphans, those who do not have anybody. That if, if God the Father goes out of his way to adopt us as his children, then we as his people should go out of his way to adopt his orphan children here upon this earth. And as I was thinking a little bit about that, you know, my wife and my daughter Sarah are not here. I think they've already left. Uh, she's getting some award this morning, and she's out doing that, and Kim's being a good mom. But some of you may know that my wife Kim is adopted, and uh, she and her brother Tim, Kim and Tim, you like that, right? Kim and Tim. Uh, Kimmy and Timmy, that was probably fun in that household, but um, they, they are both adopted, so my my mother-in-law had two twins, actually, on my birthday, December 3rd, 1969, and they both died at birth, and she hemorrhaged heavily, and uh, she almost bled out. She had, some, she had three major surgeries, and she survived. She was in the hospital for two weeks, and they said, you can no longer have any kids. So what her and my father, uh, Al, did was they said, well, perfect. God's taken away this option. Now we get to choose our kids. They had a great attitude about it. Now we get to choose our kids. Not what God's going to give us, but we get to choose. And so they went on this extravaganza where they, they pooled money and resources and all that, and they looked in Denver, and they looked in Carl Springs, and they looked in Pueblo, and they looked all over. And under, out of hundreds and hundreds of kids, they chose my wonderful wife, Kim. And so when she was little, they would say, she would say when they taught her, you're adopted, because people would ask, you know, and so they had a teacher. They had this little bitty book called The Chosen One. And so Al would scoop little Kimmy on, her, on his lap, and 
And he would read through each night this book, The Chosen One, how you are our chosen one. We could have had many, and we could afford them, and we could have had them. We have a great home, but we chose you because you are that valuable to us. And they did the same thing for Tim. My wife, I didn't know she was adopted until we'd been dating like two years. Because her and her mom are so much the same and so close. Her father and her are so close, I I just didn't even think about it. It was just one of those things. And I think that's a perfect picture of our adoption into the family of God. The reality is our sin keeps us out of God's family. We are lost in our sin. We are alienated from God the way that Ephesians 2 talks about. We are dead in our sins. And God the Father goes out of his way, much like the prodigal son that we just heard about, right? Should be called the, the good father is what that, that parable ought to be called, that, that chip read. And God the Father goes out of his way, and he seeks us, and he finds us, and he draws us to himself, and he adopts us into his heavenly family as his sons and his daughters. So we're going to look at that in chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. The previous part was just background to tie it into what we did before. Let's go ahead and look at that. First of all, who were we before under Christ? Before we had Christ, who were we, right? Verses 1 through 3. Paul's making this argument. What I'm saying is that as long as an heir, meaning an heir to a father, right, is underage, he's no different from a slave even though he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees, that word could be translated managers, until the time set by his father. So also when we were underage, we were sl- under the slavery under the elemental spiritual powers of this world or spiritual forces of this world. Paul's using an analogy to say, before we had Christ, remember his big argument in Galatians is, don't forget, because we're going to go back a couple months, is the Galatians were these series of churches, this group of churches in central Turkey today. If you cut Turkey, a big stripe down in the middle, There was a group of churches in that area which was called Galatia. And these Judaizers, these people came that were Jewish and said, Jesus is great, you guys have Jesus, but Jesus isn't enough. And along with Jesus, you have to follow Judaism's dietary laws, the new moons, the Sabbaths, their their festivals and all the things that we do, the the festival of booths and this, that, and the other. You've got to be circumcised in your flesh and you've got to do all these things, observe the Sabbath, all this stuff. And so it's Jesus plus something else. So Paul's writing to the churches in Galatia as a correction and saying, it is Jesus plus what? Nothing. Oh, you guys are so good. You remember. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus plus nothing. You add nothing to it. You don't need any dietary laws. You don't need to follow the Sabbath. You don't need to do all this stuff. It's Jesus plus nothing. Jesus brings us into the family, right? And so as he's making this argument, he says he's using something everybody knew at that time. Now remember, the time frame was Rome was governing the world. And before that, the Greeks did too. And the Romans stole a bunch of good ideas, right? Every good culture is like that. We never invent the wheel. We steal from other good cultures that have invented the wheel. So the Romans stole from the Greco, I mean, from the Greeks. And so together, this Greco-Roman kind of culture was... That when you were young, when you were little, a father would not leave everything in your charge. All right? He's not going to give a five-year-old charge of the kingdom of his house. The guy doesn't know what he's doing, the little five-year-old. So he would have, usually, if he was a good Roman, he would have a Greek teacher, a slave that would be the manager, the trustee, the guardian of that young child. And your job, because the Greeks were well-educated, Greek slave teach and instruct my child in the Roman ways, in the classics of the Greek culture, of how to manage the household and stuff. Have him watch me, you instruct him, and they were kind of like their personal mentor or tutor. But more than that, almost like, a, almost like a lawyer, a little guardian, a little manager, a trustee. And then when they hit the age of 14, they got more power. And then the full estate was, this, was put upon them when they hit the age of 25, now, we now know in modern psychology, neuroscience, that you know, men's brains are not wired until you're about 25. Isn't that true? Every wife can say what? Amen, Amen right? It's true. So, man, you don't want to put the men in charge because they're out raping and pillaging and killing everything, right? So you wait till they're 25, and even, even the Romans got it back then, the Greeks. 
Then you're, that son, usually the eldest, was in charge of everything. He took over the estate for his aging father, and he ran things. But he had all this childhood and this tutelage and this tutor that brought him up, right? And so Paul's using this argument. He's using something that they know. He says, when you're underage, it's more like you're a slave because the son wasn't just like his son. The son's rights legally were not to the estate. It was more like the slave that the son was with. And he says, you're like a slave before Christ. You don't own the whole estate of God. You are an heir, but you're, you're, not, you're subject to the guardians and trustees until the time set by the Father. And so Paul is building this argument that before we know Christ, before we knew Jesus, that we are a little bit like that. God wanted us to be part of his family. Adam and Eve were. They sinned against God. They rebelled against God by choice, by decision. And guess what? They were cast out of his kingdom. And now they're alienated from God. And so we're kind of like a slave out there that doesn't have the full rights. We don't get the kingdom of God. We don't get the full rights as sons and daughters. We don't get the spiritual powers, right? And then Paul goes on to say, as he works down through this text, he says, you're subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by the Father. What he's using is what's something in the natural world that applied in the spiritual world, which is the law. We talked a lot about Galatians being about the law. And that's the Old Testament Mosaic law, given by Moses, Ten Commandments, 633 laws. And so Paul is saying, just like this guy was over you when you were young, he was your mentor, your guardian, your trustee, the law of God did the same thing. Now what does a mentor or guardian or trustee do for us? What do they do? They guide us. They teach us. When you're five and you run over the playground and you smack your dog between the eyes and bloody his nose, they say, don't do that. You can't kill your animals, right? Don't do that. You know, you say, I'm going to go use the restroom behind the tree, and they say, stop doing that. You're out in public. Go to the right place. And they kind of put us in a box, and they put us in parameters, and we say, we want that ball. And they say, no, you got to share it with your brother Tommy. You know, you got to do those things. And so a guardian, a mentor, the trustee kind of teaches us and guides us, giving us parameters. And the law of God, the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments did the same thing. Love God with everything. Have no idols, no graven images before him. Be good and honor your father and your mother, right? Obey the day of the Lord, the Sabbath. Don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't lie and bear false witness to your neighbor. All those things. They kind of give us guidelines that are healthy and good. Having watched my culture recently in the news, it would be great if we re-examined whether we'd like to adopt that ethical principle once again, right? I think that back in the day, a few years ago, a couple of, of decades ago, when we took the Ten Commandments out of the schools... And when we took the Ten Commandments out of the public hall, or when we, when we did those things, I understand people talking about church and state, separation, all that stuff. But when we did that, we basically said to our culture, these ethical principles we no longer value. So on our money, we say, in God we trust. But then we tell all of our children and everybody else, we don't really trust God. We don't really believe in these things. And so we open the door for alternative philosophies and other ideas from around the world, and our culture is bearing the fruit of that. The law was a tutor. It was teaching us to obey God, right? That we couldn't do it on our own. What else did it teach us? As we tried to obey those 633 laws, we figured out real quick, guess what? I can't do that. I'm really trying hard, Jesus. I'm really trying hard, God, but I can't do it. I can't get that done. And so we figured out, That the law, this this was a holiness of God, but that we couldn't perfect, perfectly do that. And so the law was our tutor. It was our, our manager that was teaching us to obey God, but that we could not perfectly obey God, and that we would fail over and over and over. And so it was designed, according to earlier in this text, earlier in this book, to drive us towards God to meet that need. And of course, that set us up for who to come. Jesus Christ, to meet that need, right? And so Paul's making this argument. You are, you're, you're one of God's children made in his image, 
but you're like a young child that doesn't have the heir to the whole thing. And you're under the law, and the law is teaching you. I think it's chapter 3, verses uh, 24, something like that, talks about that. 22, uh, let's see where it is. Yeah, 24. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. And now that faith has come, verse 25, we are no longer under that guardian. So Paul says, before Christ You're under the law, it's your tutor, it's your guardian, it's the one that's going to show you that you desperately need somebody else to make you right with God. And so you're there until when? Until the time set forth by who? Verse 2, set forth by the Father, right? In verse 3, it also says that while we're under this this power of the law, it says that we're under slavery to what? Verse 3. We're under the slavery of the elemental spiritual forces of this world. Now, this is heavily debated, what it's talking about. But I don't think, you know, the scholars kind of get lost in all the discussion. When we see the elemental spiritual forces of this world, who's Jesus talking about? Who's Paul talking about? The devil and his minions, right? We all understand that. Who runs this world? It says in the book of Ephesians that he's the prince of the power of the air and that they run this world. And so that's what it's talking about, that when we're under the slavery of sin and under the bondage or this lockup of, of the law, that we're under the spiritual forces of this earth. Now remember, all this is before we're adopted by God. We were slaves to our sinful nature within us. When it came a calling, we went a doing of bad things. And then the law pointed out, what are you doing? You can't do that. That's wrong. And we would try to do better, and we would try to be good enough, and we would try, and we would try, and we would try. And what would we do? We would fail. It was not enough. It was not good enough because we didn't have power within. So then Paul moves us through this this discussion, right? Now, before we move on to that of adoption, I want you to think about it like this. A simple analogy that everybody here can probably understand. When you go fishing, you go up on the mesa, or you go to one of these clear lakes up here, you go to one of these clear streams, you go fishing. I've fallen in love a little bit with fishing. God forbid that I said that. But I've fallen a little bit with fishing over here because I can go up on the mesa. And these lakes you can see, I mean, you can look, you know, you can look down like 10, 15 feet. And so when you cast one of those lures, by the way, If you need to know what lure to use, make sure you talk to Mr. Stratman. That guy knows what he's talking about, okay? So I buy a couple of the lures he was telling me about. I go up on the lake. I cast it out, and I'm reeling it in. Boom. Boom. I got some action. I'm not sitting. This is great. This is almost like hunting. We're throwing it. We're casting it. We're reeling it in. Pretty soon, I see this little rainbow trout, and he's following that lure, and I'm thinking he's going to snatch it. And then he peels off. <laughs> Throw it out. Reel it in. Throw it out. Reel it in. Pretty soon, he comes out of all that little greenery in there, and he follows that lure. And I thought, I got him now. But then he breaks off. You know how the story goes. So you've got to be patient. That's why I'm trying to learn how to fish, because I'm not very patient. It's going to build patience in me. Fruits of the Spirit, yet, yeah, okay? So my daughter said, Dad, just keep going. You, you got him. Just keep going. You got to have a good daughter to encourage you, right? Throw out there. You know, pretty soon that fish comes out again and is following it. And then, bam, it strikes. You jerk and you pull it in, right? That's exactly the picture of what the sin principle and Satan did with us before Jesus Christ. It would lure us in by the quote, quote, shininess, the goodness of this earth. And we would follow it just like that fish. And sometimes we would peel off, but eventually it would own us. Satan is the father of lies, the destroyer of our world, Jesus says, and he's luring us with the bait of great and shiny things in this world. And that's what it was like. Before we knew Jesus Christ. Now, let's move on. Verse 4. But when the set time had fully come. Now, what's that talking about? What that's talking about is this, uh, this idea of redemptive history. If you want to think about human history in four parts, 
This will be helpful for you to understand your Bible and the world that you live in. There's four parts. Creation. When God created us, in the beginning God created what? The heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. And he created this on day one, he created this on day two, and it was good, right? And then when he came to man and woman, it was very good. And creation, everything was perfect. Paradise, Eden, yummies. The animals did what we said. Hey, monkey, come here. I'm going to name you, blah, 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 blah. And I'm alone. And so God puts me to sleep and takes a rib out, creates the woman, and she comes. And, and then Adam's like, wow, you know, his socks are blown off, just like we are today. And everything's great. Everything's perfect. Everything in there is yours, except for that tree, the one tree in the center. Just don't touch it. And all the rest of it's freebies. It's all good. Love, have fun, procreate, have a great time, run everything. And then we do what? The second act, fall. We disobey God. We eat of the tree, both man and woman. It wasn't like Adam wasn't right there when it happened. He was. For probably he ate the whole apple. (laughs) Typical guys. And then we fell. And then we're broken. And sin enters into our realm and it infects everything from the DNA on up. It is spiritual. It is physical. Anybody knows anything about physics knows that everything moves towards entropy, the destruction of all things. is a second law of thermodynamics. We all know these things are true. And so you have creation. Everything's perfect. You have our fall where we break everything. And now when the full time has come, third act, the third act is redemption. Jesus comes on the scene and he redeems all of creation back to God Almighty. Redemption, creation, fall, redemption, and the last act still to come when Jesus comes back, restoration, when all things are made new, the new Jerusalem, the new city of David, the new heavens, the new earth, all of it, right? It'll be back to almost Eden, but better, much better. Those four acts, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. What Paul's talking about here in verse four is, but when the time set had fully come, At just the perfect time, God the Father sends his son into the world, Jesus Christ. Now, why was it the perfect time? Why was it the time for redemption to come? What were things that happened in in history, in humanity that made it the ideal time? Why did God choose then instead of another time? Apologists and theologians have debated this for centuries, but we know some great things that are pretty clear. The Romans ruled the world with an iron fist. And you say, that doesn't sound so great. But the good news that comes from that is there's peace in the land everywhere. You know why there's peace everywhere? Because the big Roman legion that's down on the corner, if you're bad, he's going to kick your teeth in. If you rise up, he's going to squash you and kill you right there. Anybody who messed with Rome was put to death brutally, swiftly, and violently. Guess what? Less crime. Less war. You're more worried about the Romans than about your enemy. My enemy becomes my friend against Rome, right? And so in that peace, it made it easy for the gospel to spread. In addition, the Romans created the vast, huge Roman road system. They paved roads all over the world with these bricks. They used slave labor. That wasn't so great if you're one of those slaves. But they put in these huge roads, these highways, this interstate, except for it was inter-country system all over the world. And so we take it for granted. We jump in our automobiles. We jump in our planes. We can go all over the world. Back then, you traveled on foot. It could take you half a year or a year to travel just a short distance. Or even on horseback, maybe half that time. But with the Roman road, it made movement of things like the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ, very rapid, very quick. There was also a shared language, Latin, the Roman language. Now that everybody was learning a shared language and it was required of them, now you could share the gospel among cultures and different languages very quickly. Here's the third, fourth principle, urbanization. Does that sound like us today? Where everybody in the world's moving towards the cities. Now we know that's a bad idea. We got it right, right, as rural people? We got it right. It took me 26 years to figure out to get out of the city, man. This is not working. Get out of the city. Come, to, come back to a rural setting like I grew up. But as the world moves into the cities 
and they live very close and they're tight, those things that we don't like, it makes it very easy for the gospel to move among people in apartment settings and stuff like that. One of the reasons the gospel is exploding in China. So all these things come together for redemptive history. Jesus comes upon the scene. All these things are going on. The centrality geographically of Asia Minor and Southern Europe and Northern Africa. And, and the gospel begins with Jesus Christ in Jerusalem and it moves out from there. And it captures all these different people and all these different cultures. And then it spreads throughout the world. So when the Father says in verse 4, But when the time set had fully come, God waited till just the perfect time that he had planned in history to insert his son. And when he inserts his son, it goes on to say, God sent his son, his son Jesus, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Now, why does Paul have this, this thing? God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. What, 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 is, what is this fourfold thing about? Paul's very intentional in his writing, and he says, it's initiated by us? No, it's initiated by God. God the Father seeks you and I as his sons and daughters, and he knows that we're broken from him because of sin, and that sin alienates us from him, and he knows we're not going to seek him. We cannot seek him in our broken state. So he sends his son, Jesus Christ. And so when he's talking about Jesus, God sent his son, he's saying Jesus is God, just like his father. He's talking about the deity of Jesus Christ. God sent his son, deity, just like him. He initiated, and his son is going to pay the, pay the cost. Father sent, that's intentionality, his son. Later on, Jesus explains it in this parable of the landowner. The landowner puts these guys in charge of his land and his fields and his vineyards. Kind of like us in charge of the Garden of Eden. Sound familiar? And he tells them, I need you to do this, I need you to do that. And while he's there, they do it. But when he leaves, they fall and become slack. They don't do what they're supposed to do. They kind of hang out. They're playing PS4. No, just kidding. Whatever's going on, you know. They're doing something else. They're on the internet. They're on Facebook. No, just kidding. Just whatever they're doing, right? They're doing those things. They're doing their own thing. So the landowner says, well, they're not going to listen to the guys I got running the place. I'm going to send my son. And he sends his son, and the son says, guys, we need you to tend this place. We need you to do this. We need you to do that. And they decide they're not going to listen to the son. And what does the parable say they do to the son? They kill him. Sound like the story of Jesus? God the Father sends his son, fully God. Colossians 1, 15 through 21 says, Hebrews chapter 1 says, he is the image of the invisible God, 100% fully deity in, in bodily form. John chapter 1, verse 14 says, Christ came among us, the word became among us, and he dwelt among us in flesh. He became flesh and dwelt among us. And so God sends his son, but we don't like that. And so we kill him. We put him on the cross. God initiates, God tries to rescue, God tries to save, and our response is, no thanks, God. And we put him to death. We do. God's people, his creation, right? So then Paul moves down and he says, born of a woman. Why does he say he was born of a woman? Well, we've talked about the deity of God. Born of a woman means that he's also human. He was born of... Mother Mary, right? I've often thought about a guy that I, that I often read. He wrote about if Jesus was asked, who are you from each side of your family? And when he's answering, he says, well, on my mother's side, I sleep because I get tired. On my mother's side, I thirst and so I drink. On my mother's side, I get hungry so I eat bread and fish. On my mother's side, I get sad at the loss of a friend so I cry. On my mother's side, I get weak. I'm human. Well, tell me about your father. Man, on my father's side, I speak and nature does what I say. I speak and the universe comes into existence. On my father's side, I say it and it's done. 
On my father's side, the greatest evil forces in, in human history and in the universe's history come against me at the last battle, and I speak, and their bodies are a carnage in the fields. On my father's side, when somebody dies, I walk over and I touch them, and they're raised from the dead. On my father's side, when a demon inhabits a little boy, I hold his precious little face, and the demon's gone. He's driven out, and he asks me where to send him. My resume on my father's side is pretty sweet, right? Paul's building the argument on both sides, and this is not to minimize Mother Mary, precious, obedient, godly Mother Mary, his mother, but she's human. But the Holy Spirit comes upon her and conceives the Son through her, right? And so the Father, God the Father, sends his Son, and he's born in humanity among women, and he's born under the law. Why is that important? Because he has to live just like us. He has to be one of us in every way. He cannot be different than us other than in his deity, but in his humanity he has to be completely like us. He has to thirst. He has to hunger. He has to use the restroom. He has to get weak. He has to sleep or else he's not really one of us. And he has to be tempted by sin, just like every single one of us. Or else he cannot live perfectly under the law and make us right. Why is he born under the law? He has to be like one of us in his humanity, but he has to completely do what we can't do. He has to be impeccable, perfect. He has to fully obey the law, all 633 of them. Where we can't, he can. When we falter, he doesn't. He has to do all of those things. Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one that has been tempted in every way, that is just as we are, yet he did not sin. That's why he's born in law. When we falter under the law, and the law acts kind of like a prison for us, yeah, do the right thing. Uh, you messed up again. Uh, you did wrong. Jesus fulfills the law and does it all perfectly. And then when he goes in our place as our substitute to the cross, as one of us bearing our sins for the whole world, he has fulfilled the law he has lived the perfect life. He is the perfect Lamb of God, the perfect substitute in our place. That's why it's important that he's born under the law. 1 Peter 2.22 says that Jesus, he committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin for us. This substitution, what the book of Galatians is all about, we don't become adopted as sons and daughters of God unless we accept Jesus Christ by faith and trust him and his finished work on the cross to purchase a place in heaven with God Almighty. We don't become that person. And so Jesus had to be one of us. He had to be God sent by God the Father. He had to be one of us, born of a woman, he had to live under law, just like us, tempted in every way so that he could emphasize, em, em, empathize with us and love us and yet not sin. And so he, re, he fulfilled all of those things. And so then it says, verse 5, to redeem those under the law. That's us. He goes to the cross in our place. He's our substitute. And when we apply that spiritually to our lives, by trusting in his finished work on the cross and believing and trusting him to forgive us of our sins and to give us his perfection. When we trust that, when we believe in that, when we accept that and submit to that, then we are adopted as sons and daughters of God. But I don't want you to make a mistake of thinking it was an easy road. Jesus had to fulfill all of it. He had to do everything. And so when he says at the end of his time, his seven sins on the cross, it is finished. That statement is loaded with thousands of volumes of all that he did for you and I. The book of John, chapter 21, verse 25, next to the last verse there, I think it is the last verse in the Gospel of John. 
John says, I testify of these things, and I write down what I've seen in the life of Jesus Christ. And I say these things, but you know what? There's many other things that Jesus did that we didn't write in this book. And I suppose if I wrote them all down, there wouldn't be enough space in the entire world to hold all the books. Jesus' life is way too big for us. All that he did for us. We will spend eternity thanking God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit for what Jesus Christ did on our behalf. Amen? Forever. And then what happens? That we might receive adoption to sonship. The end of verse 5, right? So now, if we accept Christ, we're redeemed by Christ, then, then who we are as sons in Christ. Verse 4 at the end through verse 7, okay? It says that we are born under the law to redeem those under the law, right? Jesus was, that we might receive adoptions of sonship. And because we are sons, now, I want you to be honest with you, that's very intentional about using the male form of that. Some Bibles want to erase that and say sons and daughters. Why is it intentional in this text here? And it's earlier why Paul tells you he's using the male form of son. Who inherits everything of the father on earth? The firstborn son, right? The sons, not the daughters. So to complete the analogy, Paul's saying that he adopts us as sons. Now, if you're a woman, he adopts you as a daughter, right? But he's completing this discussion because you are his sons, and that means you daughters too, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the Holy Spirit who calls out Abba Father, right? So our status becomes what verse, chapter 4 verse 1 says, that we are heirs, and then chapter 7 says that God has made you, at the last part of chapter se- uh, verse 7, God has made you also an heir. So our status becomes as we're adopted in the family of God, As the Father comes after us and sends His Son and provides redemption and He fulfills the law and He lives a perfect life and He dies a substitute in our place and He shows us the way and He does everything we can't and we accept that and we're adopted in the family of God, guess what? Now we are sons with Him. Sons and daughters of God Almighty, amen? Now brothers and sisters, it's been a long path to get there, but that is good news. That is good news. That is the whole enchilada of the Christian life. Because we are heirs if we are adopted. Now, if I'm an heir to what the Father has, what do I get? I get a big, big house, man. (laughs) Right? Lifestyles of the rich and famous is nothing. Donald Trump eats your heart out. Right? The head of Microsoft, you are chump change compared to what I have in my father's house. Right? Right? The fifth richest billionaire in the world built a yacht that's the same size as a United States destroyer in the Navy. And he armed it to the teeth with attack helicopters, his own paramilitary force, 50 calibers, torpedoes, blah, 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 right? And he could afford it because he's worth like $40 billion, whatever it is. That is nothing compared to what you and I have in Christ Jesus. And it's because we are in Christ. When the Father sees us, he sees who? Jesus. How does the Father feel about Jesus? Do you remember Jesus' baptism? When he was baptized by John the Baptist and he goes under? This is my son whom I am, what? Well pleased. He make me happy, the Father says. My son is the bomb in today's language, right? He's the stuff. He makes me happy. He makes me pleased. Listen to him. And we are co-heirs with Christ. Now, I want you to get how powerful this is. Romans 8, 17. Now, if we are children of God, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and, this is the biblical text, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. We are co-heirs of Christ. You know what else the scripture says in the book of Corinthians? No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Do you not give the best things that you have to your children? Don't you? Yeah. God gives us the best things that he has. And a little bit later it's going to say he's put the spirit in our hearts. 
The Spirit of the Son of God, of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. That's the best thing. It's God himself dwelling within us, right? Right here, verse 6. God sent the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of his Son, Jesus Christ, into our hearts. The Holy Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Right? That tear, that that term of endearment. It's not really like daddy. We over, we over sentimentalize that. But it's like the, the, the child that runs, dad, father. It's more like when my kids call me papa. It's a sense of respect, but it's a sense of endearment and closeness and intimacy. And Sarah was the, one of the best at this. Sarah would say, papa, papa, papa. When she was little, papa, papa, papa. da 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 Big smile, come running, papa, papa, papa. Dude, I dropped everything, scooped her in my arms, and forgot about the rest of the world when I came home, right? I lived to come home to see little Sarah. Yeah, yeah, papa, papa, papa. The Father's the same way with us. He lives and exists because he's God Almighty forever. But he wants us to live and exist with him as co-heirs of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, let's not forget how we got there through the perfect work and completed death of Jesus Christ in our place. We may be co-heirs of Christ, but we are not equal with Christ. Amen? Amen. He is our Lord and our Master, and we will be at his feet as he sits at the right hand of the Father. Because the Scripture says all things will be put underneath his feet at the end of time in Philippians. But we're co-heirs. And what is it like? You guys ever heard Audio Adrenaline song, My Father's House? Big, big house with lots and lots of food. Big, big table, right? Lots and lots of food. Big, big yard where we can play football. And they give you this picture of all these things that we love in my father's house. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be just wonderful, more than we can say, and it's our privilege. Our status as heirs means that we get the privilege of John 14, 1 through 6, right? Jesus said, do not be troubled. Don't be troubled. I'm coming back. I go away from you. He's in the flesh with his disciples. I go away from you, and I'm going to prepare a place for you, and when I go to prepare a place for you, my father's house are what? Many mansions, many dwelling places, many wonderful places for us to live, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again to what? Receive you, to take you to be with me. That where I am, you may be also. Why do we read that at funerals and memorials? Because it's the truth of the gospel that gives us hope. That our Christian loved ones are with Christ right now, and we will join them someday soon. In my Father's house are these wonderful things. Abba, Father, That term didn't even come on the scene until the Gospels of Jesus using it. He would come to his father and he would say, Abba, Father, I need. Father, I just want to spend time with you. He would get alone to lonely places. He would go up on the mountain and he would pray or he'd get in the desert and he would pray. He would get away from the disciples and all the ministry and everything and he would get alone with the Father and he would look towards heaven and you've seen those pictures of him praying in the Garden of Gethsemane with his hands on the rock crossed and he'd say, Abba, Father, I need to drink from you again. Just give me a little bit of your time. And on the cross when he died, what is one of the seven sayings that he said? My father, my father, why have you what? Forsaken me. When the sins of the world were carried in his body, according to Galatians 3.13, as he hung on the tree, he was the curse under the law for you and I in our place, hanging on the tree, the cross, and the father temporarily cuts him off. And that's a big theology, that's a big discussion we could have off, off sermon. And Jesus feels that break in that relationship and he says, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't care about the pain, he doesn't care about the agony, he cares about the fellowship. Now can you imagine as co-heirs that we're going to have that kind of relationship with the father that what we're going to care about is the fellowship of the father. If you're having your quiet times daily now, your devotional times, whatever, or however so often that you do it, you're experiencing a piece of that. As you come into the fellowship as a congregation and we gather together and we worship together, you're experiencing that now, a taste of it, but a sliver of the divine. Abba, Father, in verse 6, 
He put the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who cries out that Abba Father, right? One of our privileges is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit dwells within us now. He's here. He unionizes us to the Father. Romans 8.26 says that the Holy Spirit prays and intercedes with groans that we do not understand. It says that when you don't know how to pray, have you ever been to a place where you're so desperate you don't know how to pray? You don't even have the words for it. You're in such pain. The Holy Spirit steps in and cries out to the Father with groans that we don't even understand. I don't know what that means, but I think it's great when God talks to God on my behalf. The Spirit intercedes for us. John chapter 14, verse 17 says he's the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And verse 26 says he's our advocate, our counselor, one who walks alongside us, that teaches us and guides us. You want to know the will of God? Go talk to the Spirit of God in the Son's name. He will lead us into all truth, not some truth that we pick out of our head, but a truth that collaborates and agrees with what he wrote, the Holy Spirit wrote, the Bible. You want to know what God's will is for you? Read this text and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. The Spirit and the Word have always gone hand in hand like a well-intertwined rope. You cannot separate the Spirit of God from the Word of God. You can't do it. And hence why I have a problem with certain charismatic movements that try to do that. They, they put the Spirit up here and they poo-poo the Word of God, so to speak. And I'm not naming any particular group. I'm talking about certain sects that are out of the norm. But the problem is... The Spirit of God will never contradict the Word of God because He wrote it. It's His heart and His mind. Acts 1.8 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power to share the gospel, to do things for the Lord, to do ministry, to handle the burdens that you're under. And here it says that He testifies within us that we are God's sons. He gives us assurance of our salvation. Chip read the prodigal son parable earlier. If you want to know what God the Father thinks about you, think about that parable of the Father. Think about what it says in the book of Luke, chapter 15. It says that the Father sees him when he's far off. Does it say the Son sees the Father? No. It says the Father looks way off. He's looking for his Son to return from his debauchery. He's looking, he's looking, he's looking, he's looking, he's looking, and he probably sent people out to find him and couldn't. He's looking, he's looking, and when he sees his son far off, what does he do? He takes the initiative, picks up his robe, and runs to meet his son. That picture that the artist does that has some unnamed individual that we don't see their face with Jesus' head hanging over, embracing around him, that is theologically accurate to the biblical text. Because when the prodigal son comes and the father grabs him, what does it say? It says he grabs him around his neck and he embraces him. Kill the fatted calf, get the gold ring, get the fine purple. Why are you doing all this? This is the bad son. My lost son is now found and we're going to celebrate. We're going to party like it's 1999, according to Prince, right? I wish he was partying with Jesus now. There's no party like a Jesus party. I've told you that. And that's biblical. In the book of Luke, Jesus says that I am the good shepherd and my people are my sheep and they know my voice and they hear my voice and they follow it. In fact, Brad did a brilliant job, not knowing I was going to mention that, starting the service with that. That's a God thing. But after that, he says, when one of us is lost, it's like one sheep that goes off, that the shepherd goes off to find that one sheep, and when he finds him, it says, when a sinner repents, it says what? That the angels of heaven rejoice with one sinner that repents, one of us that turned back to God There's no party like a Jesus party. As sons and daughters of God, as the heirs and parent, co-heirs of Christ, 
we get the privilege of calling him Father, of him loving us and seeking us and coming after us. And when we're believers and we turn away from him and do our own thing, he still lovingly comes after us and seeks us. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He brings us to himself. And so as we close, I think the best application of the doctrine of adoption is this. Be part of the family of God, right? Be part of the family of God. You need to be part of the family of God. Maybe you hang out with the family of God, but you're not part of the family of God. Let me give you an illustration of that. When I was growing up, there was a young man that I went to school with named Sammy. Sammy came from a tough home. His mom had an addiction with methamphetamines. I didn't know that when I was young, but I found out that later. And alcohol, and she had a little love-idle relationship with, with drugs and alcohol, and so she never had time for Sammy. So I invited Sammy to church, and my mom went and picked up Sammy all the time, and my dad went and picked up Sammy all the time, and Sammy would hang out with us, and he'd say, he was in my house, and he, he never said, hey, Greg, you're so great. Can I hang out with you? He, he was at our house, and he'd have dinner with us and stuff and all that, and I think he just loved my parents. I wasn't so great, but my parents would. And he'd say, can I just stay for the night? Sure, Sam. So he'd stay the night. Well, one night turned into two. Two turned into three. Three turned into a week. One summer, it turned into six weeks when my father said, Sam, you got to go home, bud. We got to go see if your mom's even around. We got to take you home. For weeks, he'd been taking him to get clothes, and Sam just stayed. But was Sam part of our family? Was he one of our family? No. He wasn't a teal. He hung out with the Teals. He was around our family. He was hanging out with our family, but he wasn't one of our family. My parents didn't adopt him. They kind of informally did, but not legally, not permanently. Sometimes we come to church and we're with the family of God, but we're not part and one of the family of God. You get the difference? We're hanging out with the family of God, but we personally don't know Jesus Christ by faith and trusting in him to save us from our individual sins. We're hanging out with the family of God. We're doing everything that's part of the family of God, and we love you, and we're glad that you're here, and we never want that to change. But you have to make a decision, personally, individually, to follow Jesus Christ and to trust his work on the cross as the substitute in your place for you to be born into the family of God, to be one of us. And here's the thing. We're all rooting for you, man. We're all rooting for you. I just buried a young man yesterday, okay? Just did his memorial. It comes and it goes and death is real and people pass all the time. I've done three funerals in a month. It doesn't take much. Death is walks at our door, and I'd be a liar if I told you otherwise. You think that you have more time to choose Jesus, you may not. I wish people did. I wish that I could give people more time to choose Jesus, but I don't have that power. But you have the power to make a decision for you. If you're one of us and among us, but not really part of us because you have never personally trusted Jesus Christ and said, I have a sin problem with you, God, and Jesus has taken it away. I trust what Jesus has done. Apply it to my life. Today can be your day of salvation. Today can be a game changer for you for eternity. And I'm asking you as your friend, you are part of the family of God, but we want you as a brother and sister adopted in. Take this time as the band comes and as they sing to come and speak to me about how you can be part of the family of God. Let's pray.